I'm sure you have met people who will argue that black is white. Wouldn't it be nice to respond in the same vein, but with solid empirical evidence on your side? So next time you meet one of those types, ask them a nice, simple question. What colour is the paint job on this car? And when they have done umming and ahhing their way through the rainbow, you can confidently tell them that they are wrong, and that the paint job is in fact black, which is not really a colour at all, but even if it was, is most definitely not purple, green, orange, or any other colour in between or otherwise. Of course, you will have to back up such a bold claim with something substantial, and that is where this video comes in. For my fifth video in this trilogy on impossible things, I again return to light, that all-pervading thing which we so often take for granted and understand so little about. Before I give light my full attention, I should explain some context. Firstly, when I speak of light, I shall mostly mean monochromatic light. Newton proved that white light, as we get from the sun, can be separated into individual colours using a prism, and that these individual colours could not then be separated further. We understand that the colours of light represent individual wavelengths of the light spectrum, and so I shall be discussing light of a single wavelength. I shall also be talking about photons, which immediately makes us think of light, but photons are the energy carriers for the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which covers everything from radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, and of course, visible light. The wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum range from subatomic, for gamma rays, to potentially the diameter of the universe. The part of this spectrum visible to humans is tiny, at between just 390 and 700 nanometers, approximately. So when we are discussing photons, what we say applies equally to photons bringing signals to your radio, heating up your microwave meal, or allowing you to see yourself in a mirror. I also need to discuss waves. We talk about radio waves, and I've even mentioned the wavelength of light. It is a fact that for almost all purposes, Maxwell's wave equations can be used to describe interactions in the electromagnetic world. This is the world of classical physics. Newton's law of gravitation inhabits this same world and also explains the everyday interaction of gravity well enough to be used to send probes to Mars and beyond. But when we get to the subatomic world, we enter the realm of quantum physics, the standard model, and point particles. And so we need to be clear that the laws of classical physics no longer accurately describe what is observed through experimentation when dealing with photons. So when I use frequency or wavelength to describe the properties of light, you must always remember that light is best and most accurately described as a photon or point particle, except, except when it's not. not. It is absolutely not a wave, not ever, even if its interactions can be very accurately described using wave equations. I hope that's clear. Let's get back to Newton. Newton's optics is not the easiest of reads, but I think it's worth the effort as it provides a very clear example of how a great intellect investigated the phenomenon that is light, using nothing but his naked eyes and his brain. Nowadays, we take for granted that scientists, and even school children, use lasers, computers, high-speed cameras, and highly engineered machine ground prisms and lenses to observe the properties of light. Newton's only light sources were the sun and naked flames. He had no electricity, and had to laboriously grind many of his own prisms and lenses by hand. And so it's not surprising that he did not get everything correct. But as modern science can still not explain light, we should not feel too smug about the progress which we, or more accurately others, have made since Newton's time. Christian Huygens, Newton's contemporary, had explained light as a longitudinal wave, but his longitudinal waves did not correctly explain the observed properties of light. Huygens' theory of light as a wave appeared to explain interference and refraction, but Newton decided, for the wrong reasons limited by his ability to experiment, that light was corpuscular, or in modern terms, a particle. Both Huygens and Newton thought that light reacted with, or caused a reaction within, some all-pervading ether. That the ether existed was pretty much accepted by the scientific community for a very long time, in the second half of the 19th century, physicists could feel pretty smug with themselves. Maxwell had unified electricity, magnetism, heat and light with his wave equations in 1865, and a new age was dawning. Electricity had truly shrunk the world. 
The Cook and Wheatstone Needle Telegraph was running from 1838 in the UK, the same year as Samuel Morse sent his first telegram in the USA. In 1850, a submarine cable connected Britain to mainland Europe. In 1866, the first telegraph communication between the UK and the USA was possible. Before this, news, travelling by ship, would take 10 days to reach across the Atlantic. Now, news, good and bad, could spread in minutes. By 1872, Australia was connected, and the world was wired for sound. Laying the transatlantic cable to the USA took three very expensive attempts, and succeeded in great part due to the involvement of William Thompson, who, as well as becoming famous and wealthy as a result, was knighted in 1866 for his efforts. Sir Thompson was then elevated in 1892, becoming Lord Kelvin. A year later, Lord Kelvin would write the preface to Electric Waves, a translation of Heinrich Hertz's Researches on the Propagation of Electric Action with Finite Velocity Through Space. In that preface, Lord Kelvin wrote of the history of discovery in the field of electromagnetics and concludes with, During the 56 years which have passed since Faraday first offended physical mathematicians with his curved lines of force, many workers and many thinkers have helped to build up the 19th century school of plenum, one ether for light, heat, electricity, magnetism, and the German and English volumes containing Hertz's electrical papers given to the world in the last decade of the century will be a permanent monument of the splendid consummation now realised. We can see from this that the idea of the plenum, a universe filled with matter, luminiferous ether in place of what we now consider the near vacuum of space, was a solid hypothesis in 1893 and the case was settled in Kelvin's mind. And we can see from this preface and the history of science how the ground had shifted before settling. However, an earthquake had already arrived. In fact, between 1881 and 1887, the Michelson-Morley experiments provided evidence that there was no luminiferous ether. These experiments have been hailed as one of the most important, most groundbreaking in the history of physics. But this did not stop many people, including Michelson and Morley, from continuing to search for the all-pervading ether. To this day, we do not know how light travels through a vacuum. Perhaps the ether is still there, perhaps in a form or in a dimension we cannot detect. One of the outcomes of the Michelson Morley experiments was Heinrich Lorentz's attempt to explain their failure to observe the ether by introducing the concept of local time for observers who are either resting in the ether or moving in it. Key to this concept of local time is the Lorentz factor, which determines length contraction and explains an observer's inability to detect relative motion. Henri Poincaré took Lorentz's work further, and then in 1905 Einstein published four Nobel Prize-worthy papers, only one of which won him the award. One that didn't was titled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, in which he gave us the theory of special relativity. Where was I? Oh yes, light. Newton distracted me with his ether. So in the early 19th century, it was shown that light did indeed behave as a wave, in fact a transverse wave, in all respects then known. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, through the work primarily of Max Planck and Einstein, light was proven to be a quantized energy or particle, so that for any given frequency or color of light, the light energy would be carried by individual photons of a specific energy value. I hope that's clear. Where we are now is that light is best described as coming in quanta, or photons. Were it a wave, then you could gradually reduce the output of a light source and a detector would continually register the light as it diminished. Whereas in fact, every experiment has proven that if you wind down the light source far enough, the detector will pick up individual blips as individual photons are received. We do not experience this because Whilst the sensors in our retina react to the energy each single photon imparts to them, neural filters mean that we can only experience light when a sufficient number of photons hit the same spot in a very short period of time, giving us the impression that we are receiving a stream of light rather than individual blips or photons. Knowing all that, we can return to Newton's experiments, which were based on a corpuscular nature of light. If we consider a given piece of glass, we know that it will reflect a set amount of light, say 4%. But how, if light is, as we have shown it to be, a particle, are 4% reflected back to us whilst the rest continue into or through the glass? 
What if we could send just a single photon to the glass? What would determine that it was only reflected back to us 4% of the time? Is it truly down to chance, like the roll of a dice? Well, yes, it is. The quantum world is, as far as has yet been determined, probabilistic. And it is probabilistic equations which are used to describe the action of photons. The problem which Newton could not resolve with his corpuscular light was this. If you shine a light on a piece of glass, some of the light is reflected. Now, if light reflects from a sheet of glass, then it might seem reasonable that adding a second sheet of glass would increase the amount of light reflected. But what Newton found was that by adjusting the distance between the sheets, he could actually reduce the light reflected to zero. Or to turn the problem around and put it in Newton's words, the light which falls upon the farther surface of the first glass, where the interval between the glasses is not above the ten hundred thousandth part of an inch, will go through that surface and through the air or vacuum between the glasses and enter into the second glass. But if the second glass be taken away, the light which goes out of the second surface of the first glass into the air or vacuum will not go on forwards, but turns back into the first glass and is reflected, and therefore it is drawn back by the power of the first glass, there being nothing else to turn it back. Newton had determined that the reflection of light from the first glass was dictated by whether a second plate of glass was introduced and the distance between the two glasses. He questioned whether it was possible that something was feeling ahead of the corpuscle and then acted back upon it should a second surface be contacted. Newton was never satisfied by this. His experiment involved resting a convex lens on top of a flat glass plate and then shining monochromatic light from above and observing what he saw. What he saw were alternate rings of light and black, the position of which was determined by the size of the gap between the curving surface of the concave lens and the flat glass plate beneath it. Different coloured lights, light of differing frequency, result in the rings appearing in different positions because the different wavelengths of light interfere at different thicknesses of the gap between the surfaces. You may have spotted Newton's problem, and ours. The description I gave of Newton's rings was all about frequencies and wavelengths of light. It might be common sense to imagine that the light is a wave, and the peaks and troughs of the waves bouncing off the two surfaces then interfere with one another, like the ripples on water, and cancel each other out, or augment each other's amplitude. But Newton did not think light was a wave, and I have told you that light, as we currently understand it, is most definitely not a wave. So how do we explain what we see? Another wave. You can't seem to avoid them when talking about particles of light. Now, let us imagine for a second that light is a standing wave interacting with a surface. It should be clear that the amplitude of the wave at the point it intersects the surface is dependent on the distance of the source of light from the surface. Here, the amplitude of the wave will be maximum, and here, minimum. And of course, though light is most definitely not a wave, this is what Newton saw and what we see. Let us set up an experiment with a light source and a photomultiplier to detect the photons. In this experiment, we will vary the thickness of the glass and we will see that the probability of a photon being detected by our photomultiplier is dependent on the thickness of the glass. A glass surface will reflect 4% of the light shone on it. As we vary the thickness of the glass, we shall see that the light detected at the photomultiplier varies in a regular fashion from zero light detected to 8% of the light detected and back to zero in a cyclical fashion. Newton did this experiment himself with hand ground lenses and sunlight and it is astonishing that he was able to determine that placing a curved lens over a flat glass plate would result in 34,386 rings as the thickness varied over one quarter of an inch. The phenomenon had been detailed by Robert Hooke in his 1664 Micrographia, but it was Newton who analysed it, and for him the rings are named. Newton's problem and ours is this. Light comes in discrete quanta, particles in our terminology, corpuscles in Newton's. So how can the reflectivity of particles hitting the top surface of a piece of glass be affected by how far away the bottom surface is, or even by another piece of glass or another being placed below the first? We now inhabit a quantum world of which Newton had no knowledge, and we also know that photons are not actually reflected at all. 
A photon is a massless energy particle which only travels in straight lines and always at the speed of light. So when a photon arrives at a mirror, it imparts energy to excite electrons in the mirror, which then release energy as a new photon. The reflectivity of a surface is in fact the quantum probability that a photon directed at the surface will result in another photon being detected at a properly positioned photomultiplier. There is no wave, there is no particle wave duality, there is only the light particle or photon, which just happens to be described by probabilistic wave functions. We do not know why particles behave as they do, but quantum electrodynamics allows us, well, not me, but much more cleverer people, to describe how particles will behave, probably. We have a clear description, description and not explanation, of what is happening from Newton and his rings, and we've probably all seen it in action a thousand times. Soap bubbles. The bubble gives us two reflective surfaces, with the thickness between them altering as the bubble develops. The individual colours within the white light hitting the bubble are reflected at points where the thickness of the bubble corresponds to their wavelength. The bubble itself has no colour, and the effect is purely one of varying reflectivity. The same thing happens with oil and water. The oil is not rainbow coloured, and neither is the water. It is the varying thickness of the oil, or more properly the varying distance between the transition layers, which determines what frequencies or colours of light are reflected. And the same idea applies to the colour of our TVR. The paint job is an undercoat, usually black or dark grey, over which is sprayed a clear coat containing tiny micrometer flakes of aluminium, chromium and glass-like magnesium fluoride. There is no colour pigmentation in the finish and the colour flip properties of the paint job are solely due to the effects we see in the soap bubble and as described above. So light is not waves and does not reflect. We have an idea of what it does, but not why. And many of the colours we see are not colours at all, but are an effect of uneven surfaces through which light is transmitted back to our eyes. Of course nature, or your favourite god, got there first. A peacock's tail feathers are brown, as are the wings of butterflies and many other wonders of nature. Robert Hooke described the small scale structure of the peacock's feather in his Micrographia. The parts of the feathers of this glorious bird appear, through the microscope, to be no less gaudy than do the whole feathers, for, as to the naked eye, it is evident that the stem or quill of each feather in the tail sends out multitudes of lateral branches. And he goes on. So each of those threads in the microscope appears a large, long body, consisting of a multitude of bright, reflecting parts, whose figure tis no easy matter to determine, as he that examines it shall find. For every new position of it to the light makes it perfectly seem of another form and shape, and nothing what it appeared a little before. We can see how flowers perform the same trick of the eye, and the fruit of the marble berry exploits this structural coloration quite beautifully to produce one of the most intense colours in nature, with reflectivity equal to that of a silvered mirror. I said quite beautifully. What does that even mean? It is obvious from this video that colours, which are the result of physical structures, are not colours at all, because the structures themselves have no special pigmentation. But then anything we perceive as colour is only the result of the selective reflection and absorption of different wavelengths of light by objects, and the resultant arrival at our retinas of a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is our brains which imbue the signals from the rods and cones in our retina with any emotional meaning. So why are we emotionally moved by certain electromagnetic frequencies? Why do animals and insects react as they do? when presented by these colourful displays. It could be because some god wanted us to praise his brilliance at artistry and creation, if gods have egos, that is. Or perhaps evolutionary theory provides a better explanation for the diversity we see in nature. Thanks, as always, for watching.